Hi, I'm James Bowles and I'm here to answer your questions about the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. We've had a number of questions around why the pole position time in 2020 was around 7 tenths slower than what we had the year before. That's actually the first circuit for the circuits that have been mirrored across both years that we've been slower. The conditions are pretty much the same. It's the same track temperature, the same ambient temperature, so it's not that. Often that can be a factor. The track itself has been resurfaced in a small number of places. But again, that's not the dominant factor. On the evidence that we can see so far, our gap this year relative to the McLarens and other teams behind us, Renault for example and Racing Point, was too small. If you look back at Bahrain or circuits before that, we have a healthy margin to those teams and we didn't on this occasion. So part of the reason is that we underperformed in qualifying this year. The question is why. The C5 compound, the softest compound of the Pirelli range, is what we use. It's that soft tyre in Abu Dhabi. And we've used that before in Sochi. And it's a tricky little tyre to get into the right window. And I don't think we were absolutely spot on in getting it perfectly aligned with the track and the conditions. So I think in part, that was the issue. We were a little bit slower. In fact, on Friday, we did a lap with Lewis that was removed because he went outside of track limits but that would have been quite a bit faster than what we achieved in qualifying. Just evidence that we didn't have it quite all together for qualifying itself. As for why it's such a big margin, 7 tenths, you will get the odd bit of variability year on year, even taking into account what I said on ambient conditions, etc. But ultimately, I just don't think we performed at our best. To answer your questions over why we double stacked the stops, why we didn't leave a car out, we really need to look at how all the tyres were performing in Abu Dhabi. We had three compounds there, the C5, the softest compound, which we reused in qualifying, the C4, which was the medium compound, and finally the C3, which was the hard compound with the white band around the outside. Of all of those tyres, there was only one that was really performing very well on a race run, and that was the hard tyre. It was very durable. Our models predicted that you could run it quite easily from nearly the whole race distance, bar a few laps. More so, it had very little degradation, not enough certainly to make up a pit stop on that. So the reason why the whole field piled in on a VSC, so not even a safety car, we didn't know it was going to go safety car that time on um, lap 10, was because we knew that hard tyre can go to the end of the race, and you'll never make up that deficit in time that you'll gain as a result of the VSC. There were a few cars that were out and remained out, the Ferrari namely being two of them, but it didn't work out as well for them. Had we stayed out with Lewis or Valtteri, we would have been in the lead of the race, no doubt about that. But both Red Bulls would have had the edge on us. They would have been on a tyre that's actually better. The medium would have degraded very quickly. And whilst we would have been theoretically ahead on the road, we never ever would have pulled them out our pit stop window. In fact, it's predicted that they would have caught up to the back of us. Now we would have done as long a stint on that medium as we could, so possibly around about 26, 30 laps, stopped and fitted the hard tyre. But now with that pit stop being under full racing speed, we were forecast to never ever catch up to the back of Albon. So long and short of it was, we had no choice, as did no other teams. When you have a tyre that's that robust and that strong, and the strongest tyre that can do the whole race, you have to take that opportunity to stop if there's a VSC or safety car. To answer your question about the MG UK and what we did with it across the weekend, it's best to give you a little bit of background. There were some issues with Perez in Bahrain that caused ultimately him to stop. We also had some awareness of issues with George during the Abu Dhabi weekend. And as a precaution, and solely as a precaution, we decided to detune some of the power settings on the MG UK at certain points in the weekend only. To be clear, it didn't affect our fastest laps in qualifying. That was us pushing to the maximum. We just weren't quick enough on the tyres. In terms of the race itself, it was a system or a number of ways of using the K that we, we used a little bit more sparingly. The performance wasn't dramatic. It was around about a tenth a lap. And it wasn't a system that we stopped using. We just used it less than we normally would. It's certainly not the reason why we lost the race, either in qualifying or actually on Sunday. It was just a component as to why perhaps Red Bull pulled away a little bit more than we would have liked. We've had a question come in about how did we lose to Red Bull on a track that we're normally very, very strong at? Good question. One that 
believe you me, we're asking ourselves today, and we will continue to until we have enough answers to really conclude what happened. First and foremost, Red Bull have been there or thereabouts all season. They've been developing the car. They had new developments this weekend as well in terms of a new rear wing on the car. And you wouldn't put something on unless it was faster. So what's clear is that at some point, a competitive team like Red Bull was going to catch us. But that doesn't explain everything. We definitely took a step back relative to the field. So what went wrong? In qualifying itself, as previously answered, there's some evidence we just weren't quite there with the tyres. But that doesn't answer the race. The race was on the medium compound and the hard compound, and we thought we were in quite a good range on those. Looking at the balance of the car, we were just suffering with terrible amounts of understeer. And this track punishes you. In fact, it's the front right tyre that you need to look after. Most tracks are rear dominated. This one's very much an issue on the front right because of the cornering that you have in Abu Dhabi. And uh, that held us back. It certainly meant that we weren't performing at our best in the race, and it wasn't our intention to have a balance that was oriented that way. Does that explain everything? I'm not sure. Um, but ultimately, that's what this week is all about. At the end of the race, you, you may have seen both of our cars doing donuts together at the same time on the start finish straight. Verstappen wasn't with us and I asked Red Bull why, and I think that was just a communication error. They'd forgotten about it and Verstappen therefore didn't make his way to the grid. But the question is, is it bad for the components? It's not brilliant. Um, you're running the engine near enough on the limiter as you're going around the circles. The gearbox itself depends on how you release the power down. If you progressively put the power through, it's okay. We've generally seen that we haven't damaged the gearbox terminally, but it's not great for any of the setup. Clearly, our car is not designed to have the rear wheel spinning and rotating around in circles for 30 seconds to a minute. But that car also would be stripped down after the race. And we do have a test but it'll be built up of other components rather than the ones used that weekend. We had a special livery on the car in Abu Dhabi this weekend, and one that made me fiercely proud. It was the names of everyone that's been involved in the project to win the championship this year. As you look from the back of the car on the left-hand side, that was all the chassis side. And on the right-hand side was HPP, the power unit side. And there was around 2,000 names total spread across both sides. It was a tremendous effort to get that livery completed. Starting with HR on both sides, compiling a complete list of names of who's been associated with the project. Following on, communications, marketing and graphics who had to produce what you saw during the weekend. Our paint shop and stickering shops had to work really quite hard to produce all of that very quickly to get it out to the track. For me personally, it was a very proud moment to see my name on the car, but not just mine, that of many people that have contributed towards the success we had this year. We've shared experiences and ultimately prevailed with seven double world championships together in difficult times. And that's what this symbolizes. We've had some questions about the Red Star, the Nikki Louder Star. That was still on the bodywork. It just was in a slightly different position. It was now, if you look at the left-hand side bodywork, if you're looking from the back of the car, it's towards the driver's helmet and roll hoop but still very much there. The final question is about the winter break and what happens. If we look at the team as a whole, what you see on TV is just the tip of the iceberg. You see 60 operational people. But as I mentioned previously, there's 2,000 people involved in this project. So therefore, by definition, most back at the respective sites in Brixworth and in Brackley working incredibly hard to produce the car, to design the car, to work on effectively giving us the tools to be able to go and race and fight for championships. That work never ceases apart from during obligatory shutdown periods. The winter's one of the busiest time. So if we look first of all at the factory and what they're doing, next year's car, while a lot of it is carryover, is still being designed, built and produced. It needs to be up and ready for running next year. And that requires a tremendous amount of effort. And furthermore, with the regulations for 2022 coming in, which will be an enormous change to everything we're used to, we need people to move across to that as soon as possible in January and start work there. So that sort of covers off what most of the factory are doing. It's a machine that never really sleeps. In terms of strategy and engineering and those track side, there's a few things we do. First of all, we'll take just a little bit of a break to recover. It's been a a hard and difficult year. We'll come back in January, and what we're looking to do now is develop the systems, tools, and methods we used across the year. 
We can't stay still, be it on car performance or on the systems that we rely on. We need to ensure that we have data available faster, more accurate data available as well. In the terms of strategies, we rely on a number of models. For example, we try and predict how tyres will behave on our competitors. Those all need work. They need development time. And that's what we do during the course of the winter so that when we get to racing again, hopefully in Melbourne, we're ready to go with updated systems. We've reached the end of 2020 and the last race debrief of the season. Thank you very much to all of you that have been a part of the journey and sent your questions in and contributed. We now look towards 2021 and look forward to answering your questions after the first Grand Prix.